And welcome back to an episode of the Cooler Jets podcast where it was Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, Robert Sala's first year is in the books. The Jets wrapping up their season. A bit of a disappointing one, but, you know, the last few weeks of the season, I think we definitely saw a lot of growth. And there's a lot of optimism for, for next year. Uh, clearly this is, and I feel like we say this every year, but this is one of the most important off seasons uh, that the franchise has had because I think there's a real opportunity to turn this from a four-win team into a playoff team. Uh, there's a lot to talk about today. We want to go over the season, talk about looking ahead to this off season. And obviously over the next few weeks, we're going to have a lot of different podcasts looking at free agency, the drafts, looking at Zach Wilson's film, hopefully some interviews. So uh, this is, I think our podcast generally thrives in these next few months. So I'm really looking forward to it. But before we look forward, let's look back. Uh, what were your initial takeaways and thoughts from Robert Sala's first year as head coach of the New York Jets? Yeah, I really feel like that this is a season where the win total kind of didn't sum up how I felt about how the season went. I actually put out a tweet recently. I ranked the enjoyment level of the 11 seasons in the Jets playoff drought. And I had uh, this season at fifth out of 11. So I, I thought even though this was, it was obviously tough to go through. They went four and 13, but there were a lot of moments where you could see, you know, watching this rookie class or guys from the previous draft class or various young players where you could watch and be like, that guy can be a part of this team getting back to the playoffs. He can be a part of us winning the Super Bowl, and even just both units as a whole, specifically the offense, if we're being honest. But there were moments where you're like, I can see the vision for this team involving these players, these coaches, um, where when everything clicks, once these guys, younger players, get some years to hone their game in the league, get used to being professionals, and get you know muster up that level of consistency then there is a foundation in place for there to be success here with the people that they have in place with more development and obviously adding more pieces. So I really felt like this was a strong foundational season. Maybe strong is not the best word for a four-win team, but you could see the potential to what this franchise can grow into with these players if they make the right moves and if the young players they do have, their trajectories are as positive and linear as you hope they can be with year to year progression. So um, I thought this was a more fun season than most four win seasons should be just because of those glimpses uh, of, of hope that we had throughout this year. So it's definitely, it's like you said, every year we say it's a huge off season, but um, whenever you're going into year two of a rookie quarterback and a rookie head coach, entire new regime, it obviously is important because you got to supplement every that foundation that you built and figure out how can we take this to that next level so it, it is important in a lot of different ways as they try to help all these young players get to that next stage of their career in an effective fashion so it's it's going to be a very fun off season and it really feels like we're in the early stages but more so than previous years it feels like there are more possibilities in terms of what needs do you address how do you address them because previous years felt like you know got to get O-line, got to get offensive help, got to get an edge rusher. But now it's like as many pieces as, you know, they have and I'm gushing about, they can really address almost anything aside from quarterback in a, in a serious big investment type of manner. So right. uh, it's going to be really fun to, to, be, to debate all of this stuff every single day throughout the next few months. Yeah, I think year three is typically the make or break it year for a quarterback or head coach. But I think year two is a huge signifier of, of whether or not they're on track to, to be what you hope they would be. And then I guess if you look at GMs, this is technically Joe Douglas. This is Joe Douglas's third offseason uh, as the general manager. So this is, I think, a time that he's really going to go and be aggressive. Obviously, there's not an ownership change. Christopher Johnson is still in the building, but Woody's back. And maybe he's changed. Maybe his brothers talk some sense into him. Uh, but what we know from when Woody Johnson was the acting owner is that he's not a guy that necessarily accepts uh, bad results. I mean, he can get impatient at times. And I'm not saying that Joe Douglas is on the hot seat, but I think he definitely needs to show. Um, I, th I definitely think he's going to be aggressive because he needs to show in 2022 a significant leap. Uh, when you look back at Saul, I think, you know, a year ago, you and I were doing those head coaching uh, podcast where we interviewed a bunch of uh, beat reporters and talked about all the candidates. And I really enjoyed doing that. And I think you and I both walked away with a very high impression of Robert Sala, not just his success as a defensive coordinator, but he was exactly what it, it sounded like the Jets were looking for, which was that head coach. And for the billionth time, that CEO head coach. And I think Sala really displayed a lot of the attributes and traits that you would 
want out of a head coach. Um, and I think when you look at his staff, there are certainly some improvements on the offensive side of the ball. I really like what Michael Floor brought. I think with one more offseason and to, to really boost the talent there, specific, specifically at receiver and maybe even offensive line, uh, and Zach getting more comfortable in the scheme, I really think you're going to see that open up. Um, defensively, uh, I have some concerns. Um, how could you not, given the 32nd ranked defense? But the one thing that we really liked about Sala in the process was his ability to evolve. He wasn't necessary. He wasn't a guy like Adam Gase who was extremely stubborn and always thought they were right. I mean, Sala ran basically three different iterations of his defense in San Francisco. He was constantly evolving with how teams were exploiting him. You know, when he got there, it was very much that base cover three Legion of Boom Seahawks defense. Uh, and it was just too vanilla. His first year as defense coordinator, Sala was not that successful. In fact, some people wanted him fired. He brought in Chris Kasarik and changed him more to a wide nine front. Obviously, they went and got Bosa. Uh, and, you know, that was a, a huge leap for them. But then you saw Mahomes in the fourth quarter of that Super Bowl just kind of tore apart their zone defense. So the next year, he brought in Tony Oden, who's actually the Jets' defensive backs coach, and they added some more man coverage principles and, and made their defense a little more exotic. Uh, and you saw them survive throughout the rash of injuries they had in 2020. So Saul is a guy who continuously evolves, and that is a really telling trait if a guy's going to be a successful quarter or successful head coach. Um, but yeah. And, and I, th- I think go ahead. I'm to cut you off, but I think that's a key point that we should, all of us should remember with Salah is that a big part of the reason that we were appealed by him, or at least I was, is everything you just explained is not what he did in one year as a Niners head coach, but the way that he had evolved over the entire four year span that he was there. And, you know, it didn't start off successfully, like you said, but he made, you know, he changed things. He was open to ideas from his assistant coaches. Um, he adapted to the talent that came in, that went out. Um, so it was over four years where he, where the positive aspects of his coaching style really manifested themselves and led to positive results. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that it's not necessarily, he wasn't hired because he went somewhere and transformed everything in one year. He was hired because of the way that he showed he could execute a process over multiple years right. so we're only exactly. in the first year of that yeah and continuity for continuity's sake is never isn't always a good thing like when you look at the Ju- the giants potentially keeping joe judge like the maras are clearly doing that in an effort to because they've had a revolving door at head coach they don't want to you know they're, they're worried about the optics and wanting to keep a guy in place because continuity is a good thing but when you have a guy like Sala that you really believe in that continuity. The fact that a lot of these young Jets guys got Jets players got a bunch of reps, specifically when you look at the rookies and you know, your rookie quarterback, the fact that they're going to get an entire off season, having already run through an entire season of the system, naturally you're just going to get some improvement there because they're not going to be thinking as much, you know, especially a quarterback, but even on the defensive side of the football, the one concern I guess I would have would be, and it's on defense would be that, while we've seen this defense work when you have a super talented defense, like in San Francisco, obviously they had an amazing defensive line. They had super smart and instinctual linebackers. And then they also had some pretty good secondary play as well. We've seen this defense work when you have amazing players. We saw this year that it doesn't always work when you don't have amazing players. And then when you look around the league, you know, there are defenses and, you know, Brian Flores is a guy who just got fired and Miami has pieces on their defense, but that's a guy who clearly gets the most out of his unit. They, I'm not saying they don't have elite pieces on that defense, but I'm worried that this year they, not that they don't, they clearly need to improve that side of the ball. And they clearly a corner, they were not as good as they could have been and they need a talent infusion there. But I just feel like this defense was not good enough. Um, for, for where it needs to be. And that is the one concern I have is like, you know, I hope he's not, uh, you know, I know Ulbrich is going to get another year and he's going to be loyal and you believe in that continuity, but Jeff Ulbrich's defensive performance certainly got better the last month of the season, but that middle stretch, you can't be glossed over. You know, the jets do still have Quinn and Williams. They still do have John Franklin Myers. They have CJ Mosey. So it's not like they have complete bums out there and the product they're putting out there isn't acceptable. Now, the thing that you're not going to have to worry as much about this year was I think in year one, when you're installing a system, you worry about diverting too much to try to uh, meet the needs of the players or try to adjust based off what's happening in the season, because you want to build your program. You know, you want guys to be really comfortable with your base scheme. And then when you get into years two and years three, it's like, okay, you can do some evolutions off that, but you really want to install the base of uh, the base principles of your scheme 
And I think th- that might be part of it. Um, but on the offensive side of the ball, and this kind of speaking to what you were just mentioning, one of the things that I love Michael Floor that, that, that he did was after that bye week, they really got away from 12 personnel. I mean, they, they went back to it, but they did adjust how they were running that offense. And you saw a clear improvement there. So uh, the fact that the staff has shown the ability to evolve gives me a lot of hope. I worry a little bit about can this defense work if, if you don't have all stars at every level of the defense. Um, that's still to be remained. But I have to say, for Saul's first year, like you said, the wins weren't necessarily always there. It wasn't always pretty. Statistically speaking, they aren't very good. But I'm still optimistic, and I still think he's the guy. What other concerns? Hey, hey, one, okay, on, go ahead. one more point in the coaching. I'm, I was wondering, because you were talking about, you know, some of your concerns with Saul and everything. So looking at him individually in terms of from what, what we can see, because obviously there are a lot of factors we don't know about in the building and everything. but from what we can see on the outside, just looking at Salah, what he can control, things that he did, just his performance as a coach. Is there like what would your main critiques be? Because when I think about it, I not that he was perfect by any means, but it's hard to at this point, just one year in, kind of pinpoint anything that he's not doing well because you know, you look at the key parts of coaching, player development. There were there's a lot of positive player development stuff that we saw this year. That's got a play out over a few years so we don't know for sure yet but they got off to a good start there game management i thought he was really good he went right he was aggressive going for it on fourth downs he did it when he was supposed to there's a lot of data to back that up um you know publicly speaking to the media fantastic feels like he's a guy who can handle the pressure and is steadfast in his beliefs and his vision and what he's trying to execute see in, in terms of the vision he it seems like he knows what he wants to do you again you talked about long term not over adjusting kind of making sure guys are getting used to this so you can have that long term build make sure guys get comfortable not you know staying true to that long term look instead of trying to uh, overcompensate for the present too much so right. when i look at everything he did this season i thought he did a nice job we'll see if those things lead to long term results cuz you have to get the wins at some point but it's hard for me to find you know, strong critiques for Robert Sala this year. Right. Is there anything that comes to mind for you as, you know, negatives of what he did this year? Well, I think at least on the surface, he did a really good job of giving Jets fans what they wanted in the sense that, you know, the last two head coaches with Bowles and Gase, you know, what was one of the, the common concerns you had? There's a few. There was one was they weren't aggressive uh, on fourth down, even third down with Gates. You know, I thought the Jets were, like you said, with game management, they went for it on fourth downs. They didn't call the third and nine, you know, give up draws. They didn't punt at midfield when you're down eight or whatever, whatever Bulls was doing. And it, so I think from a game management perspective, he was good. He was aggressive. And then also, you know, with Bulls and Gates, it was, uh, I think part of this was just frustration because you have plenty of, of great coaches with a lot of different demeanors, but I liked that Sala was a fiery guy. I mean, that was one of the things that's really attractive about him is that I like that he got in the refs year and that we've seen him get angry and that we've seen him get hyped. Uh, I personally believe players respond to that. I believe they respond more to that than they do of when they cut to Adam Gase and it looks like he just got out of bed, you know, Sunday morning hung over or something. Right. Or Todd Bowles, who just looked disappointed the entire time. I, I like that he got hyped, that he, you know, he, he enlisted the energy of his players. So I really like that. So aesthetically speaking, just those things I really liked. And yeah, obviously his communication with the fans and the media and whatnot. And, you know, every time I hear him talk, I'm impressed. I haven't heard a Jets. I mean, I, I was impressed by Rex Ryan when he would talk, but I really feel like the Jets have an adult in the room. Um, I think when you look at, and you're like the stats guy, so I guess you might be able to point to some other areas here. But when you look at just the team as a whole, this is these are kind of the stuff that, that, that falls in Robert Sala. I would say their fourth quarter performances. And look, they had a lot of blowouts, so it's not like the fourth quarter performances were, were the end-all, be-all. But even when you just look at, okay, Carolina, they had a chance to win that game. People forget. Atlanta, they had a chance to win that game at the end. Uh, people forget. Both Miami games, they blew. Even New Orleans, which turned into a blowout, they could have won in the fourth quarter. Tampa Bay, they blew at this uh, at the end of the game. Buffalo, week 17, they, or week 18, excuse me, they had a chance to win and they, they couldn't get it done. Um, I think the fourth, and even, even the games that they won, Tennessee, they gave them a chance to win it and Tennessee missed the field goal. Houston, they gave them the ball back with, you know, under two minutes to go. Jacksonville was on the one yard line and could have won it. I think, and this is a message that he talked about, is they have to learn to close out games. I think the fourth quarter performance, especially on defense, it just seems like, you know, the offense would sputter for three quarters. 
this is the story in the beginning of the season, at least the offense would sputter for three quarters. They'd finally get it to go, you know, get it going. They bring it within one position. Your defense just needs to get a stop and the defense would collapse. That was the story in Carolina, Atlanta. And you saw it a few other times this season. Um, that's one area. And then the other area is you have to win division games. And that also falls on the head coach and, and, you know, fouls on talent, falls on quarterback, whatever. But those are kind of the overarching stats that I look at. It's like, okay, 0-6 in the division, as you pointed out to me today, the last two years, they're 0-12 in the division and the lack of, of closing out fourth quarter games. Because as I mentioned, and look, they wouldn't win all of these, but if they had closed out, just for argument's sake, all of those games and they, they, had, they were a strong fourth quarter team, they just would have won 11 games this year. So that's obviously far-fetched and would never happen, but it just shows you if they had were a stronger fourth quarter team and they could have come back and beat Atlanta or beat Carolina, two teams who aren't very good, you're looking at a much different season. So there's some overarching stats. What are some stats or, you know, trends that you saw that do concern you um, for this team? Because as you said, it's hard to point them out specifically with Sala, but when you look at the team as a whole, you can find some things that do fall on his shoulders. I think one thing that's interesting is that they really became, their trend between how they started games and finished games really changed near the end because obviously in the beginning of the season, they were notoriously slow starters. And then they would find their groove in second halves. But in the uh, second half of the season, then they became more of a first half team and they would start games quickly and then fall off. I mean, look at some of the games in that pre-buy stretch, you know, the Falcons, they were down by 17. Then they nearly come back at the end. Panthers down by 16, nearly come back. Uh, Titans, they were down 9-0. Nine, nine they come back to win that game. So that was the story of the entire first half. Um, and that even kind of carried over. Uh, into you know, some of those midseason games. Even Houston, they started slow and then came back and won. But really after that Houston game, then it kind of completely flipped over, and they've been a first-half team, especially offensively. You look at Philly, how hot they started, and then they do nothing in the second half. Um, Tampa Bay, they take the lead, blow it at the end. Buffalo, they stick around the whole game for uh, more than half of the game, uh, and then choke it away at the end. Um, so there were, and also Miami take an early lead and they blow that at the end, New Orleans close game, blow that at the end. So they completely changed their first half, second half sort of performance disparity in the second part of the season. So I think that is kind of promising in a way, because it's not like the entire, like with Adam Gase, it really never changed where you would get your great opening drive and there'd be nothing the rest of the game, no second half adjustments, kind of the same issues persisted and it never changed and it really did show you the kind of stubbornness and some of the holes in Adam Gase's coaching you know good game planner not a good manager of the game adjuster those sort of things but the fact that in this one season we did see the Jets show glimpses of okay they can be a second half team we saw that for much of the season but then the second half of the second part of the season we saw that they could start game strong too so I think the fact that we saw both of those things just kind of speaks to the fact that uh, they are a young team that is inconsistent trying to find that balance. So uh, I think it is promising though, at least that we saw, um, it, which kind of goes with everything else, you know, whether, whether it's the offense, the defense, any individual player, you saw glimpses of what they could be, but also plenty of inconsistency. And I think that also goes to the way they started and finished games. They struggled to start at the beginning of the year. Eventually they figured that out, but then the finishing the games kind of fell off. So uh, I think it is good that we saw both and they just like many other things need to stabilize that going forward. Yeah. I mean, they looked like a young team with the rookie coach, definitely at times, but I think the thing you wanted to see was development. I think you saw a lot of players develop throughout the year. I think you saw uh, certainly some progress in how this team played. Like you mentioned, I, I honestly kind of forgot a little bit. It's like, oh, how how awful this team was in the first half, especially offensively. Defensively, they were actually okay in some games in the first half. But it's like, if you think of the offense performance in the first half against Carolina, New England, Denver, Atlanta, I mean, these were consistently slow starters. And it only started to turn around, like you said, I mean, maybe that Houston game. I guess the Bengals game, they started all right. And the Indy game, you know, they started all right. But um yeah, this was a team that that certainly had its growing pains. Um, but the benefits of playing all these young guys were now that they've played a whole season, a lot of these guys have full reps. And it's not that you necessarily want to count on all of them to start next year, but you're comfortable if they have to come into the game. And you have to think that there's going to be some development shown over the offseason just by the fact that they got a whole season. When you look at a guy like Brandon Eccles, I don't think he should be cornerback number two. I think they should either 
draft somebody with their first four picks or sign somebody who's legitimate to start opposite Bryce Hall. But if Hall or this guy or, you know, whoever they bring in were to go down, I'm confident in Brandon Knuckles coming in, even though he didn't have an amazing season, he flashed, he got all those reps and he's comfortable. He's comfortable. It's not like the jets are gonna have to throw him out there and he's never played before. They went through all those growing pains for a lot of players last year. Guys like Quincy Williams come to mind uh, on the offensive side of the ball, obviously, you know, Michael Carter and, and Elijah Moore were young guys who probably would have had roles regardless, but those are, you know, we argued about this all the time. I don't, I was going to say veterans, but they're not veterans yet, I guess, <laughs> according to you, but they have at least had a season under their belt. They know what to expect. They understand the speed of the game. And I think that's really valuable um, for a young team. Cause sometimes you'll see, you know, teams uh, draft all the young or they're not a good team. They get a lot of young guys, but then they, you know, go with the veteran over the young guy because the veteran might be better, but yeah, he's 29, he's 30 and his ceiling, you already know it's not going to be that good. So get the young guy some exposure, let him play. He might work through some of the growing pains. Um, and then when you get to the end of the season, you have somebody who can be a real building block for you. That's the, the main reason the jets didn't sign a corner last year. And so I think looking back, that turned out to be a, a you know, it's kind of a smart move. When you think of biggest surprises on the year, I mean, corner absolutely has to come to mind. I think it, kind of evened out a little bit towards the end, but I think quarter was looked at as the Jets' biggest need um, entering the season. And I think you walk away from the season as they actually played as one of their stronger units. Obviously they weren't the strongest and they had some weaknesses, but Bryce Hall had a legitimately good season. Brandon Eccles flashed at times. Michael Carter started really hot, cooled off a little bit towards the end. But when you look at what we were expecting from this cornerback group entering the season, I think this was about the best case scenario. So what were some of the other biggest surprises you had um, from this team? Yeah, I think cornerback is definitely where you start because we were all ready for it to be the worst unit in the league. And I mean, ultimately they did end up at 30th in passing defense, but I think if you looked at the way that these corners ended up playing, I, I'm pretty sure we would all be surprised. Uh, specifically, I think Bryce, I, not necessarily, Bryce Hall's breakout wasn't necessarily surprising, but I think the way that he was able to stay healthy for the entire season and really match up with a lot of top tier guys and hold his own was, was very impressive. Obviously he didn't make too many big plays and he was beaten for a few touchdowns, but the overall body of work and some of the guys that, uh, some of the great players that he held to decent sort of games is really impressive. And then the other two obviously didn't put up the best numbers. I don't think they're starters for you going forward, but I think uh, Carter the second can be Eccles. I'm a little more questionable on, but both of them show that they're NFL players who have skills that can be useful. And for day three picks, that is above average. Most sixth and fifth round picks don't do anything for you at all. So just to get, a backup or solid low end starter is, isn't, is a nice surprise to get out of that round. So definitely starts at the corners. Um, I think in terms of other surprises, I'd probably, I would say how good Michael Carter was right away. was a surprise. Absolutely. I, I think he could have, you know, definitely been this good at some point. I, I honestly, I like to pick, but the way he played the season in terms of how great his elusiveness numbers were, I don't know if I ever thought he would get to this point. He was, number two in missed tackles force per carry. And he was also top 10 in yards after contact per carry. So he was very, very good this year. Right. And I think for him to ever get to that point, you would have taken it, even if it were in year two or year three, uh, for him to do that right away, especially after, you know, first game was rough and he kind of did look shaky in that Carolina game, but he really quickly found his groove. Uh, so I would say how good he was right away was a surprise to me. Well, and especially since they got him in the fourth round. I mean, that that he's a perfect scheme fit, and he's a guy that a lot of people saw some Aaron Jones in. Um, but, yeah, when I watched him, you just saw the difference. But the thing we kept coming back to was last year, or 2020, they took a fourth round running back in the Michael P. Ryan. Everybody's excited. It's a young running back that they drafted. I mean, it's statistically speaking one of the easier positions to hit on. And, you know, in 2020, we were just trying to see the young guys and, you know, P Ryan, I think he had, you know, a touchdown against the bills. He had a few plays, but you really see the difference in him versus Michael Carter, because the thing with P Ryan, it's like, all right, well, if he didn't get good blocking, that's going to be minus two yards. If he gets some blocking, but the linebackers there, he's only going to get three or four yards. And you'd look at him and be like, well, what else can he do? When you watch Michael Carter, that's the, you see the difference between a, just a guy and a great player. And, and Michael Carter made the most out of every single carry. He rarely got brought down by the first guy. 
Um, and yeah, he's a guy with pro bowl potential. I mean, he's a guy that I watch and say, Oh, he could be a top five running back in this league. And that's not hyperbole. Anybody who watched Michael Carter this year saw the, the, you know, that he's art. I don't want to say arguably, but he was, he was up there in terms of the most productive and best players on this team as a fourth round rookie. So you have to be ecstatic about that. Um, other surprises. I mean, just minor ones, I would say this doesn't really hold true to the, the uh, 20, the week 18 game, but I thought the, uh, I thought a guy like Dan Feeney actually played okay when he had to come in for Connor McGovern. His pass protection wasn't great, but he was good in the run blocking. And I mean, he's a guy when we watched in, in preseason, we were like, oh my gosh, this, he's horrible. Um, you know, he's better, you know, chugging beers at, at Rangers games or whatever. Um, but I, he's a guy that's like, okay, I'll bring him back his depth on the offensive line. I think we were surprised. And speaking of the offensive line, to add to that, I think you got to put George Fant in there, how yeah. good he was. Getting there is, yeah, exactly. I think George Fant, his performance at left tackle is definitely a huge surprise. Um, and he's even made the argument, his play has made the argument of maybe you move Mekhi Becton to right tackle. That's an argument for another day. But anybody who shakes their head at that and scoffs and think that's not a possibility is wrong. I'm not saying it'll happen. I think there's a very good chance that Becton enters the season as left tackle, but it'll be a discussion this offseason. It'll absolutely, absolutely be a discussion because George Fant put up elite production as a pass protector. And as Michael and I were talking before this podcast, tackle is not one of those volatile positions like cornerback where you see, you know, a guy have a great year one year and an awful year the next. Right. Generally speaking, tackle production is pretty consistent. It's one of the hardest positions to be good at and then be bad at the next year. I mean, if you have a good season, you're likely a good tackle. And granted he had a weak schedule, um, but even, you know, bad tackles get cooked by the defensive ends that he was facing. And I think Fant really put together a nice season. And I think in an ideal world, maybe you'd see, okay, does that production translate over to, to right tackle? Don't mess with Becton's head. Don't make it harder for them than it has to be. Let him just focus on getting in shape and playing left tackle. Because I think, you know, do you want to have him to try to go through a position change, whatever, but Fant, so that's the ideal situation. But if there's any sort of fall off from Fant and you think that maybe Back to might be better suited to right tackle, whatever it is. It's it's certainly a discussion. I think you might see them alternate reps uh, in training camp. Um, I yeah, mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about the point you made about the sustainability of tackle production because I think that's a big reason why I'm okay with sticking with Fant going into next year. And and I think a trade is a possibility if you can get a really good package. Um, and there are a lot of different ways you can play it out, but it's a great point that you made because you know some positions in football you can get a random breakout season you know a corner has six picks out of nowhere like marcus williams in 2015 um you know a receiver has a huge season out of nowhere just because it's a great scheme fit or whatever the positions like that you can have those random years because it only takes a handful of plays to go your way to really stand out even like a pass rusher can get a few cleanup sacks now all of a sudden he stands out but an offensive lineman for those guys to get on the map, you know, in the eyes of a fan base as a really good player, it takes, you know, I mean, the main metrics we look at are like PFF grades, you know, Pro Bowls and on Pro Bowl voting, and then pressure, total pressures on the season and their pressure rate, all these things that these are numbers that aren't like, okay, you made four interceptions. That's awesome. Out of the thousand snaps you play. These are numbers that accumu- accumulate over every single play that, they play over the course of the entire season. And in order to get there, you have to actually be really good. You can't just luck into getting those numbers because it takes consistency over the entire season, every single snap. So it's very, very rare to see fluky tackle play. And I think that you look at George Fant and how young he is in football years. I mean, the year before he got into the league was the first year that he played football as a fifth year senior uh, at Western Kentucky. So he's been playing this game two decades less than a lot of the guys around him in terms of how much he's played it in in his life. So I really think there is just a possibility he would have had this breakout regardless of which side he was on, whether it was right or left. And this just happened to be that year for him Uh, because it's not often that you just see a random season of good play for no reason. He's probably going to continue playing like this for however long his prime lasts. Right. So I'm I'm really confident that he's going to continue to play this well, regardless of which side it is. Um, because you look at right versus left with him. And I know that he has said um, when he signed with the Jets that he does prefer the left side, but his numbers were actually better on the right side than the left throughout the course of his career coming into the season. So 
I, I do feel confident that he can be good on either side and we'll see how that plays out, who they put on which side. Do they explore trading him? Do they draft a tackle prospect, put him at guard? A lot of conversations to have. But at the end of the day, I think you have a guy who just had his breakout season because he's a late bloomer who doesn't have a ton of football experience. It happened to be left tackle, but I think he can provide it on either side and they should just stick with that and feel good that we got another piece. Uh, so it was that was definitely the biggest surprise of the season. Just the fact that we be having this conversation at this point of potentially moving Makai Becton for what George Fant did is uh, a huge surprise. And it's a positive, very, very positive one for them to move forward with. Absolutely. And I think, you know, depending on how long this podcast goes, I, let, we're going to circle back to the trenches in a, in, in a bit. Uh, we talk about JD. Last surprise uh, for me has to be Braxton Berrios at the end of the season. And I know we disagree on this a little bit. I think you, you like him, think he's a fine player, but you don't seem as smitten with him as, as I am and as other members of Jets Twitter are. Um, I think his production at the end of the season is, is legitimate. And I'm not saying that he needs to be brought back on an $8 million deal or that he's, you know, him more and, and Davis. That's your starting trio right there. But I think the Jets need to make sure they bring him back. I think he's receiver number four. I think he's reliable on special teams. He can be your gadget guy. You can put him in a slot. And when I was listening to Robert Sala talk about him, part of the reason they love him is he's so reliable. And not just on the field with his hands, but the fact that he's worked his ass off, not just on the field, but in the playbook to know this offense and not just his responsibility, but everybody around him. So when he's out there, Zach Wilson doesn't have to worry about, you know, what route Braxton Barrios is going to run. They're going to be on the same page. And Braxton's a guy who can help out other receivers. I mean, he was, you know, the way Saul was talking about him, it almost sounded like he was an extension of, of, of Miles Austin out there as far as the coaching staff. Um, I think his production was, was, uh, was something that you're going to see continue. And I, you know, I've seen, it's obvious to make the, the Wayne Quebec comparison because he's like smaller white receiver or whatever. I don't see that. I think, as you pointed out, Wayne Corbett had is an amazing receiver and, and Barrios, maybe he'll reach that someday, but that's not what I see with Barrios. When I look at Braxton Barrios, the guy I see is Brad Smith and I'm not just player to player. I just mean, in the role that he plays. And when the jets lost Brad Smith, they lost a, a part of their offense. I mean, they, they really did lose a dynamic piece there. I see him as that receiver number four. He's going to be lethal on special teams. He's going to give you a touchdown or two every year there. Um, you can use him on a lot of these motion trick plays, wildcat, whatever you want to use with Braxton Berrios, which the jets granted are going to use a lot more than I think they were using Brad Smith in 2009. I mean, Brad Smith would come in and use, you know, he didn't have his wildcat package and he would you know destroy the bills every year, the, the Bengals for back-to-back -back years. But with this Jets offense, they utilize a ton of that orbit motion, a lot of those jet sweeps. Barris is perfect for that. He's reliable. He's a guy that I think they need to bring back. Like I, I'm, I'm not saying pay him everything, pay him eight, nine, ten million dollars, but bring him back. Even if you have to overpay him a little bit, bring him back. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I definitely think he should come back. Um, you know, my main counter arguments is you know just just the people who are going too far. That's really it. Just you know, sign him at all costs, eight million plus is probably a little bit too much for me but by all means i think he should be a priority because when you talk about scheme fit and just making things work with the way that you're with making your team's philosophy work and finding players that fit that you know mindset barrios definitely is perfect for what the jets are trying to do and we saw that near the end of the season when the offense started to hit his stride i mean you just look at this bills game where Jeff Smith had to be playing the Barrios role. Even Mims at time was motioning and there was no threat at all. I mean, no defender was biting on that. The Jets didn't even have confidence to let those guys make plays. And the couple of times Smith did get the ball, he didn't do anything with it. So you could see the drop off when Barrios went out. Um, and, you know, I think he is a guy who you do want to have, have back in that fourth receiver role. Like you said, I think ideally you add another top, player to put with Corey Davis and Elijah Moore that's your starting three but you know the Jets did run quite a bit of 10 personnel in the second part of the season for wide receivers um, more than most teams in the league um, and you don't always have to play the same three receivers you know you rotate them out some packages you sit down Corey Davis put Elijah Moore and your new guy on the outside Barrios in the slot there's a lot of ways to mix and match it and I think Barrios is a guy who is a big time show that he can be a big time motion threat and it's not just when he's touching the ball it's that you know the fact that he's shown he can make plays with the ball in his hands makes teams respect 
every time he motions that something might happen and it helps you open other things up for your offense. And with that element missing in this Bills game, you really saw the impact of it. Again, not just the plays that he's making, but also what you can work off of the threat of him potentially making plays. Um, So I think this season where he really improved over last year and also 2019 is I think he got the drops down. I think that was a big thing before this year. He didn't have the greatest hands. He would let some balls go off of his chest. Didn't catch too many contested passes, but this year he really stepped it up. Just look at his PFF numbers, four drops in 2020 uh, on 55 targets. And this year he'd one drop on 65 contested catches. 2020 was one for six. This year he's five for six. So that's that was huge for me because that's one of the big reasons I wasn't a huge fan entering this year. He's kind of drop prone, but this year he got down. He caught his passes and then allowed him allowed himself to show that speed and agility and also vision is a big thing because that's what makes him a good returner. He doesn't really break a lot of tackles, but he knows where the best lane is, and then that allows him to maximize his speed. And then on offense, you see that too. He doesn't break a ton of tackles, but it's because he doesn't make himself have to because he sees the best lane and then that's where his speed shows up. So he's showed that he is a perfect fit in this offense and could be a great complimentary piece. They should absolutely prioritize bringing it, bring him back. Obviously there's a ceiling to where you should go for a guy who's a backup and a fairly, fairly limited player in terms of what he could be as a starting receiver who actually has to run routes and be consistently reliable. I don't think he's necessarily that. So there is a cap on what I think you pay him. And Joe, Joe Douglas has shown he's a line in the sand guy who won't go over that line. So I don't right. think they will overpay him. But at the same time, I think he's uh, very important to this offense. And could you theoretically find someone who's similarly athletic to replace him? Sure, but it's not a slam dunk. It's I, And I said this on a, a previous episode that it's probably easier to replace than most things, which I definitely think is the case. But when you have a guy who you know is what you need in that role, like you know for sure, we saw he's great in this role, then I think you definitely make it a priority to keep that continuity going. Well, the other thing is, and this has been an issue across the entire team, and you know he didn't, he obviously didn't play the last week, but he's been durable. He's, he's been reliable on the field, off the field, and staying healthy. I mean, he's just a guy that is consistently out there and, you know, the best ability is availability. And, and Braxton yep. Barris only one there. Only one missed game in his career. Right. That was the, the Bills game. Yeah, and it was a quad contusion. It was a bruise that, you know, clearly just didn't heal. And, you know, who knows? If the Jets are fighting for a playoff spot, maybe he would have played. Um, biggest disappointments of the year, and there's a lot. I mean, this, this season was disappointing. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean that it wasn't, there weren't some good things and some optimism you can take out of it, but – I think you and I, if you go and listen to the podcast from August, I think you and I both kind of thought, okay, this is a team that maybe could be playing some meaningful games in December. We kind of thought, you know, eight wins, maybe nine wins, seven wins is fair. You know, something in that ballpark, which always seems like the fair um, prediction for every team, even if your team's bad. Yeah. You always this year, it's going to be it's going to be the same. I'm already this year, locking in my eight wins. Yeah, or nine wins. Yeah, exactly. They have a tough schedule. Things change, but. Yeah, I, again, uh, this is another year where no matter what happens this offseason, I th- bet you, you the majority of predictions you're going to see are like nine wins. Um, biggest disappointments, I mean, I'll start. There's obviously a lot. Denzel Mims has to be number one. I mean, and it really puts a hole in that 2020 draft class. Um, the fact that you were relying on, okay, you got Beck, Beckton, Mims, and Hall. You have to really like what you got there. Now it's like, okay, Beckton's been hurt. You could probably throw him up there with disappointment. I'm sure you'll, you'll, you might mention him. But Mims to me is a bigger one just because – the Jets, especially down the stretch, really needed him. I mean, you could have erased the bad taste that you had for the first few weeks of the season, for the first three quarters of the season, because he, once Corey Davis went out, he was the X receiver. The last five games of the year, it's like, okay, Denzo, obviously the season hasn't gone your way. You've had, you battled through a lot, COVID and food poisoning and battling with coaching staff, whatever it is. But if he went out in the last five games of the season and put together some productivity, not even elite production, just like, oh, he caught two touchdowns, he had you know, three, four catches a game, you know, he showed, okay, he's an NFL receiver. I think you'd walk out of here saying, you know, it's a tough season for Denzel, but you know, he can improve over the off season, whatever. We got nothing. I mean, he didn't catch a pass since uh, I, don't, I don't even remember the last time he caught a pass with the saints game. So Eagles game, actually <laughs> Eagles game. I mean, the Eagles game was the last time he caught something. So 
huge disappointment there. And now receiver is again, another big need. And in fact, the jets might take one at 10, they could trade an asset for a big receiver. They go sign somebody, but entering the year, it was okay. They got Mims Davis uh, Moore. You got Crowder coming off the bench. You got Barry. You, you felt Keelan Cole. You felt good about this receiving unit. And part of the reason the depth really fell apart was because a guy like Denzel Mims was a complete no show. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm very disappointed and what Mims showed, and I think, you know, we started, and this started very early in the offseason when he wasn't getting reps in OTAs, minicamp, and everything, and just kind of snowballed. And early on, we were taking his side. We were like, you know, play him more. You have this talented guy. Let him develop all this stuff. But as the season played out, we saw exactly what they were seeing, uh, what the coaches were seeing on the practice field. And part of it's injuries. He missed time in the offseason, all that. But that's no excuse to play. I mean, these numbers are – insanely bad i mean the last five games he played at least 20 snaps in every single game and he caught one pass out of nine targets for four yards like this is historically bad stuff and just watching the film it's like he's not the same player as that he was last year i don't know what it is maybe it is injuries but there's also a lot of body language stuff i don't see the same blocking effort that he was notorious for um there's this one play in the bills game where he saw Tyler Croft. He was he was running route up the sideline. He saw Tyler Croft catch a pass underneath on the other side of the field. And granted, he was getting tackled, but he just immediately started walking to the sideline, and the whistle didn't even blow yet. He's just walking off the field. Yeah. So I, and that's you, you that's not the body what, language of a guy who wants to make it. You know. Yeah, and and you could just see like with all of his body move, the way he runs routes, it's just not a hundred percent into it. And and the the production is you know warranted too. It's not like he's not getting the ball or there are plays where he should be getting the ball and he's not it's just he's not open he doesn't beat anybody so he shouldn't be catching the ball so it he is extremely disappointing this year and like you said like we didn't we were hoping he would have a huge season but if at least he could be good depth like a good deep threat or a good red zone threat just make a few plays here and there where it's like okay i know you offer this you can be our red zone guy going forward you could be our number four, number five, deep threat sort of player. Now it's like, should you even be in the NFL the way you played this year? He was that bad. They need a contested catch guy. Corey Davis led the team with like five or six. Like that's not good enough. And Zach Wilson is a guy who really needs that contested catch type receiver, even if it's not the perfect scheme fit or whatever. When you look at Zach Wilson, he has, especially on those deep passes, he has a lot of good passes where like, general accuracy but the pinpoint accuracy wasn't really there on the deep passes that's when you need a big bodied receiver who can get to the second level and bring it down you know that's what he did at BYU obviously he had some pinpoint deep passes there and that's an area I expect to see him improve on but when you watch him at BYU he had a lot of passes where it's like he got in the, the vicinity of Dax Milne where the DB couldn't get it and Milne did the rest and it's like that's what you needed Mims to do that's what you needed Corey Davis to do and that's what the Jets I think are going to have to go at at either receiver or if they decide they want to go with a speedier route runner type receiver, they have to go get it at a tight end. Cause Zach Wilson needs a guy that he can rely on in those types of situations. So yeah, like you said, Mims was, was, was absolutely brutal. I'm going to give you Becton is, is obviously a big one. I feel like we've talked, we kind of talked about it with Fant a little bit. Becton disappointment. Um, but again, you know, an injury I thought in the, the Panthers game, I don't think he was having an amazing game, but he wasn't that bad. I think he had, you know, some of the negativity with Becton started in training camp. It sounded like he was having a rough camp. Carl Lawson was was working him. Now, is that just because Carl Lawson's amazing and Becton has struggled with the smaller, speedier pass rushers? Maybe. Um, but Becton, yeah, didn't have a great summer um, and was having an okay game against Carolina, gets injured. Okay, this is a four to eight week injury and cut to January, he hasn't played. Um, so I, I, I clearly, I would hope, I think it's just, you know, his body just didn't heal or whatever, but Becton's a guy that I'm not going to lose faith on. I think you'll learn a lot by the type of shape that he shows up in an OTAs or, or training camp. If he gets in the best shape of his life and he's healthy, I think you have a stud there. I don't think you should overreact um, to an injury where, he, you know, you can't really blame him for the coaching staff saying that he's, you know, 48 week injury and then it, it healed longer. You know, most cases that's not an example of, of anything that he's doing assuming that he's going to his physical therapy, that he's not exacerbating the injury, doing whatever. Um, so I just, you know, they say big people heal differently. 
is that BS? Who knows? But I don't think you can really blame that on Becton. Uh, to me, it's really going to come down to the type of shape that he shows up in it. And even if he struggles at left tackle, this is still his scouting report. It's not just because of the fan performance. A lot of people thought, hey, maybe he would be better on the right side because he is just such a mauler in the run game. I mean, he clearly he's not going to really fall off there. The pass protection is where you could maybe have some issues. So Becton to me is a disappointment, but um, I, I'm still optimistic about his future. I'm going to give you, Michael, uh, an, an interesting disappointment. Some people are going to disagree with this. This might get us some hate. Quentin Williams. And that, that might be surprising mm-hmm. to a lot of people. Um, and I'm sure you might disagree with me a little bit. I think he got off to a great start to the season, but the last few weeks here, and you actually even mentioned this to me a little bit was last few yeah, weeks. I'm, I'm on your side invisible. here. He's yeah. Been keep going, though. He's been invisible. I mean, and is he a good player? Absolutely. You know, you can't complain it, on a rookie contract in this defense. You have to like what he's given you, but is he a guy that I want to give a $16 million a deal, you know, $16 million a year deal to not really. You know, there's the bad optics of, oh, the Jets are always drafting guys and trading them away or letting them walk. They're not keeping their homegrown talent. But I'm sorry, this is not a guy Joe Douglas drafted. And if he puts up another year like he did last year, I don't think the Jets should just pay him for optics. I think you you have to pay what you get on the field. And and I really like what I heard from Quinnen in the, the post, uh, you know, the season ending press conference or whatever. And he was basically saying, you know, I want to be an elite game wrecker like an Aaron Donald I have to put in the work that is exactly what you want to hear from him um and you know he was the Walter Payton man of the year for the team he seems well liked in the locker room so I'm still bullish on that he's gonna really have that true elite breakout season um in year four sometimes it takes a little longer for defensive linemen and he's not been bad like he's a good player he's very much a good player I should I should quantify that and the production he was having at the beginning of the season was was fairly high but for this defense to work you need game records in the defensive line and he the last few weeks of the season he, he really didn't show that one qualifier before i go to you michael uh it did seem like he you know he injured the shoulder at towards the end of the season i'm sure that affects him a little bit so you have to give him some you know just like his rookie year he hurt the ankle and he fought through and he said that kind of messes him up a little bit uh, who knows but you have to remember this is a different system for him so this isn't the system we saw him dominate in in 2020 it's a different one i thought he looked good early on Got a little quiet towards the end. Now, if they infuse the defensive line with a guy like Carl Lawson and, you know, maybe Carl Laptis or whatever, um, and John Franklin Myers gets moved back inside and Quinnen has a great offseason, whatever, I expect to see that production go up. But disappointment, I'll throw Quinnen out there. I agree with you. And I think it's bold of you to put him out there as your pick, but it, it's a good one, I think. Um, because this was the season where he was supposed to really establish himself as that top tier top three, top five dominant defensive tackle because 2020, you know, 2019, his career starts. He's okay. He stops the run. Well, there are flashes of pass rushing overall decent starter. 2020 comes slow start of the season, but second half before he gets hurt, he really tears it up and he starts, he plays exactly like that type of player. Did he ever, he didn't really have a slow start of the season 2020 because week two, he had the dominant game against San Francisco. A little bit because Next couple games after that, he didn't okay. do too much. But just the old – because he definitely did have that game. But really the last six or seven games he right. played of 2020 is when he had that extended stretch of, like, these are top three numbers. Right. Like, in terms of his combined run stops and pressures over, I think, the last seven games he played that year, he was num- uh, number two behind Donald for interior D lineman. So that's who you want him to be, and you just want to see that over a whole season. And he started out the first half of the season – really kind of on that track there was one point um i believe seven games into this season where he had the highest pressure rate among all defensive tackles but then it kind of trickled down and the latter half of the season was quieter he didn't do too much and ultimately you got kind of the same production as last year uh even when even when you just look at the box score not talking about pressures or anything six sacks 12 qb hits 53 tackles last year he had seven sacks 55 tackles and 14 QB hits, and he played two fewer games. So um, by all means, a good player, well above average. There aren't many tackles who can play, like who can play on in both phases as effectively as he can, who aren't, you know, he's a good run stuffer, he's a good pass rusher. He can do both, and that is really valuable. He's a very good player. But um, like you said, the way he's going to get paid, I don't think you are paying for very good. I think you're paying for great. Spot track has – his market value at 17.7 million per year. That would be fifth 
among defensive tackles. And is he top five defensive tackle right now? He's shown flashes of being able to do it in spurts, but overall he's probably more like top 15 to 20. Um, and his durability hasn't been amazing. He's missed at least three games, uh, well, two games this year and then three, of the first two. So um, by all means, a very good player and great asset. But when you start thinking about all the other guys they're going to have to pay, um, and because they're bringing a lot of first round picks in, and that's way down the line, but you know, they're going to spend a lot of money in free agency this year. Probably they already don't have as much cap space as they did last year. Um, yeah. you know, you really want that when you're, you're paying that much, you want it to be warranted. They just pay John Franklin Myers, so it's I don't know if it's as much of a given, right? As a lot of people probably treat it as just because he hasn't shown that consistent, but but like you said, you brought up his press conference, I think it's great that. He was self-aware about it. it. He basically evaluated himself the same way we both just did, that he wants to be that type of player. He knows that he's sometimes that player, other times he's just an average player. That's paraphrasing, but about what he said. So it's great to see that self-awareness, but obviously you have to see it on the field. Yeah, you can't get too greedy with the cap space. I know what you're saying about like they, they are adding a lot of first-round picks and a lot of young guys, but uh, you know you don't uh, the Jets have been in a position the last few years where they've had, you know, bounds of cap space and they, you know, keep hoarding it over. I think you're right. They're going to spend a lot of it this year. They're going to have some extensions coming up in, you know, three years down the line or whatever. But if Quinn Williams plays to the level that he was playing at the end of 2020, like you mentioned, uh, next year, I have no problem giving him a big contract. It, you know, they definitely, they want to invest in the trenches. So I don't think they have any issue with putting a lot of money on offense and defensive line, but it has to be warranted. You don't want to just give $17 million because this guy flashes and he's a top draft pick and he's got a name and you don't want to keep up the optics of your trading and getting rid of your homegrown players. Um, you just, it is important to note, and this was said about Darnold and people, you know, myself included kind of disregarded this, but Quinn Williams is not a Joe Douglas player. And that if you don't think that matters, you're wrong. I pl- GMs, value the guys they take more than the guys they don't and I'm, right. you know clearly robert saw likes him i'm sure joe douglas likes him a lot too i think he'll be i think he will get that extension but it's just something to keep an eye out last and, just, and one more one more point on quinn williams is i don't think he's the most awesome scheme fit in a four three i think the three four is great for oh, him wow. because because in, in the three four like i feel like his run defense was fantastic and he was eating up gaps, and even when he wasn't stopping runs, he was clogging up space and everything. I just don't know if he had if he's that explosive enough for a four three. Not that he isn't, because I think he's above average in all physical traits, but not necessarily amazing in terms of like that explosiveness. And then it kind of takes away from his ability to to two gap, which I think he did really well in a three four, where he's just you know coming because he was so good at he would be able to play the run, you know, get off the ball, eat up two gaps at once, just chew up that space and try to shut down running lanes. But then when it was a pass play, he was so good technically that he could still convert from a run stopping approach to pass rushing and still create pressure. Whereas in this game, he's kind of focusing mainly on pass rushing and he's not super athletic and explosive enough to fully maximize that, but it's taking away from his run stopping because He's just focusing on one gap and not he's not getting the chance to use that. His size, and not in size, his strength, I think, is his best asset, and he doesn't get to use it as much in the scheme. That, that's just how I see it. I don't think he's the greatest scheme fit, scheme fit, whereas Franklin Myers, I think, you can be more comfortable with extending because I think he is a very good scheme fit. I think he has the explosiveness for the inside, which we didn't see too much this year because he's mostly playing edge, but he could also be like that – Eric Armstead kind of player who could play both inside and outside has the size to be an edge setting defensive end opposite Carl Lawson, who's your Leo def- defensive end, your faster, speedier guy, kind of be the complement to that. So I-, I just don't know if it's the greatest scheme fit, but it'll be an interesting discussion because right. can he be an $18 million per year player? Absolutely. He's had multi-game stretches both last year and this year where he was absolutely that, but he's also had stretches where he's just, you know, an average to above average player. So we'll see. It's going to be an interesting one. And you talk about scheme fit. Um, Foley fought a Kasi, guy who's hitting the market this year at defensive tackle, team captain, leader in the locker room. I don't know if they bring him back. I, I, I cause you're right. He's not a perfect scheme fit. And, and again, people are going to say, well, you can't just like good players walk and Foley fought a Kasi is a good player. 
But yeah, he's not the perfect scheme fit. And he's a guy that might get $9 million a year. I mean, I could go see a team like Tampa Bay or Miami, whatever. Any other teams that play 3-4 and want an elite or borderline elite 3-4 nose tackle, Foley Fadakas is your guy. But in this 4-3 attacking defense, he's a good player. No doubt about it. He's he, And, you know, without him, the Jets' run defense would be a lot worse. So they definitely need to go bring in another run-stuffing defensive tackle But if they let him go. But is he going to be worth the money that he's going to get? You know, I, I know people are, don't want the Jets to penny pinch and – you know, you're just hoarding his cap space and letting good homegrown players go. But again, not a Joe Douglas guy, not a scheme fit. It's going to come down to to the line Joe Douglas draws in the sand. I think they make an attempt to bring him back, but I think he may, they may get accused of lowballing him a little bit. Um, so that's just another guy to keep an eye out for. Um, defensive tackle is definitely a bigger need than a lot of people are talking about. Um, I, I think that whether you're moving John Franklin Myers inside and adding another edge or you maybe you sign a guy like Larry Okunjobi in free agency, who I'd love. I think he's a good scheme fit. I think they need to have better pass rushing production from the defensive tackle spot. I think that was a big thing that held him back. Sheldon Rankins was pretty brutal last year. You wrote an article on him this past week. I think he's a guy you cut, free that five million up, and go spend it on a guy like Okunjobi. You know, go get a uh, another defensive pass rushing defensive tackle in free agency, and then obviously you're going to upgrade the edge, and maybe you get. You know, I've always saw John Franklin Myers as the Eric Armstead in this defense, and I don't think he really got to do that as much this year where it's like first and second down, you keep him at edge, and then on third down, you get to slide him inside. Um, the, you know, 49ers loved doing that in 2019. Um, and because of the injuries to Carl Lawson, because of the injuries to Bryce Huff, he didn't really get the opportunity to do that. If they upgrade the edge, I think you're looking at, you know, let's just say um, we'll use Bryce Huff for this example, but let's say Lawson and Huff are healthy on third down. You can have that defensive line of, Carl Lawson, Quinton Williams, John Franklin Myers, and you got Bryce Huff split outside uh, as well on, on third down. So uh, this defensive line is going to get a lot of, I, I don't think it's going to get a complete makeover, but I think it's going to certainly get uh, maybe a bigger infusion than some are expecting. Last disappointment. And I guess this will kind of just feed into what we were going to talk about. Uh, I, I'll say Zach Wilson as, as a, his rookie season. I think overall I'm happy. You know, at this point in the season, I'm happy because what you wanted to see was growth and development. And I think you saw that and that Tampa Bay game and you throw the Jacksonville game in there as well. You know, does he have the most gaudy numbers that he throw for 300 yards and three touchdowns? No. Um, but that is why, you know, box score scouting isn't as important. And when you watch it specifically in that Tampa Bay game, the reads, the anticipation, the timing, the footwork, everything, you know, everything Zach Wilson was doing in that game was veteran next level. Um, and, and it relied not just on his physical traits, but his football IQ. He was playing within the structure of the offense. Uh, that to me is, is why I'm super optimistic. If we didn't really get those games towards the end of the year, of course, you would still be talking about, okay, the growth he has to take and blah, blah, blah. But those games to me did enough to give me some sort of relief of like, oh, okay. I'm, I'm excited to see him get a full off season. His confidence is up. Uh, he'll know the entire scheme. They're going to get some upgrades on offense and, and whatnot, but just uh, as a whole, the beginning of the season was rough. And I think it's hard to say that it like, we're certainly satisfied, but when I go back and look at um, some of the podcasts we had earlier, I mean, we were talking about him throwing for 4,000 yards or him throwing for 25 touchdowns. You know, there were certainly some statistical um, benchmarks that he, he didn't reach and that's not the end all be all, but I would say as a whole, I'm happy, but when you look at our expectations versus what we got, you have, to, there's some sort of disappointment. You have to be honest yeah. about things. Um, so what do you think are the biggest areas that Zach Wilson needs to work on and improve uh, this off season? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's definitely fair to say that it was disappointing in that regard, because I think if just looking at the numbers and the numbers, let's be clear, very much undersell him this year. And they, they really don't tell the best story. Like even this bills game, for example, terrible terrible stats but i just ran through the film of that game and graded that and it was kind of like slightly below average game considering what he did individually so the stats are kind of misleading on it but like you said we had lofty expectations for him we thought he would smash jets rookie records be have one of the better rookie seasons we thought the pieces were in place for him to do that so if you told us he would get 2,300 yards, nine touchdowns, 11 interceptions, passer rating under 70, take 44 sacks for a league high, 370 sack yards, 
then I think, yeah, we would definitely be really disappointed. But the way it played out, when you contextualize all that and look at the way he progressed uh, in the post-injury stretch and then, you know, just go beyond the numbers and actually look at his process on the field and the way he improved his accuracy and his decision-making, his confidence, calmness, the way he's running the offense, all that stuff, I think we definitely uh, are coming out of the season feeling good about it. But with that being said, it's definitely – disappointing relative to what i think we hope to see but it also means we are kind of irrational when we are making those predictions but um looking forward i think that i really liked in the second part of the season i feel like from a consistency and stability standpoint it was a a very good look at what you want him to be the ball security i mean obviously he had the five intercept five game streak with no picks but just looking at more realistically overall last seven games, he had three turnovers, two picks and the one loss fumble against Miami. So three turnovers in seven games puts you on pace for about six or seven for the whole season. That's awesome. If he can be do that going forward, it's exactly where you want to be. Uh, And then the consistency, I think at which he was making the right decisions, kind of executing some of the easier throws compared to earlier in the season was also solid. So I think those are the biggest things going forward is to maintain those two things, the ball security and just how, how much better he was at executing within the structure, making easy throws, but then going forward, what's going to elevate him beyond, you know, just, okay, you're good at the simple um, required parts of the position is can he unlock uh, the explosive parts of his game? Because as good as he was in the second half, and this isn't entirely his fault. It's has a lot to do with the receivers being hurt but there was not a ton of explosion in terms of downfield passing, which is why his yards per attempt was so low in most of these games and for the whole season um, is because he didn't get those huge plays. And then the one game he did have where he almost hit 300 yards is when he was able to make those downfield plays against the Titans in week four. So that's the biggest thing to me in terms of getting to that next level. I feel like he showed in the second half that he can be stable, be consistent, run the offense, protect the ball, which is a great place to be. But can he unlock that deep passing part of his game? Can he consistently make plays on the move outside the pocket, which we know he can do, Um, but that's what's really going to put him over the top from uh, a good, solid quarterback to being being great. But those are things we know he has, and it's just going to come down to the chemistry with his receivers, how they build – the skill position group around him. But uh, I guess those are my main goals, kind of maintain the ball security and the consistency that we saw in the second half while also expanding upon the big playmaking. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of great stuff there. Um, specifically, I mean, when he, when he, week one, you look at, and even week two, week three, week four, when you look at the quarterback he was, it's night and day. I mean, he's clearly a much improved quarterback and you talk about that, those big plays not being there week one. I mean, he was looking for it. I mean, he actually, he honestly had two could have been huge plays the drop by Elijah Moore and then the one to Davis that was just outside his arms. And then you, you know, you had a few of those where he was trying to push it too far down the field and he wasn't just taking what was there. I think you saw him thoroughly improve on that um, as the season went on for me, when I look at Zach Wilson, I think his accuracy is something that when you want to just talk about disappointment, I think that was maybe if you're looking at Zach Wilson as a whole, that would be the one thing that I would say was the most disappointing part was because, but you're encouraged because um, not dissimilar to a guy like Josh Allen, who struggled year one in accuracy and you see how his every year's accuracy has gotten better. But unlike Josh Allen, we saw him be accurate with the football in college. So I think my, I don't think it's as far fetched to think that he's going to revert back to the mean, maybe a little bit more. And you saw the accuracy get a lot better as the season went on, especially in the short term, the short, uh, you know, the short passes where it seems like the layups that he was just overthinking and missing. You saw him get a lot better there. I think his intermediate accuracy all season was actually pretty good. Uh, The deep accuracy is the thing that I really want to see him improve on. I think he missed a few big throws. Um, And, you know, a lot of that's footwork throwing off his back foot, uh, whatever it is, but I, and not having great receivers who can make those jump ball type of catches, but I think you're going to see that deep production go up uh, if he really focuses on his, on his deep accuracy. I think that was uh, pretty underwhelming this year. He had a few great ones, a few ones that got dropped. You know, I think of that, that the, the play to the Corey Davis against Denver that I think a lot of people forgot when he rolled out and flicked it across the, you know, his body and 
hit Corey Davis right in the hands. Like that's an example of he has that elite accuracy or even the Corey Davis touchdown against Tennessee or whatever. Um, he had a few of those, but he missed Davis uh, against Atlanta for a big touchdown. Even in this week 18 game, he had Ty Johnson that wheel route and underthrew him a little bit. Although Johnson maybe could have made a better play on the ball and got pass interference. Whatever. Yeah, it's, it's those vertical ones. Like the two you right. just mentioned, there's also the, the Crowder one. I forget which game that was one of those, uh, end of the season games maybe the saints yeah uh, but there's that crowder one yeah the um end zone. elijah moore against the falcons as well so it's kind of the, i mean it's the nine other than uh, yeah other than the titans game did we really see any vertical deep balls completed from him this season i mean you saw of, uh, he... i guess against the panthers denzel mams he's wide open though so well and he that's had really a big uh that particular route the you know the nine route anything vertical I think it's something he can improve a lot on. Yeah. He did a lot better job on those crossers. I think he had a little, he had some shaky throws earlier in the season, but I think his, you saw the crossers, the out routes, a lot of, as I said, I, I actually thought his intermediate accuracy was not that bad. It was his short term. His short accuracy was pretty horrendous for a little bit for, for no reason, just missing a lot of uh, layups. He seemed to clean that up. His intermediate accuracy I was pretty satisfied with his deep accuracy. You really need to see him improve on, but then, you know, you see, it, it like you said it was a lot of it was the vertical stuff because even like deep crossers like the the one to Cole against Tennessee uh in overtime he had two against New England in week two you know it was game was already a blowout but he had uh down the sideline to Barrios and Jeff Smith that were absolute dimes uh, so he had down the field accurate throws but on those nine routes you just didn't really see it there so I think that's something you um the Jets really need to he really needs to work on and maybe the Jets need to get him more of a burner who could create more separation or more of a jump ball guy who can bring in those, those throws that are have general accuracy, but not the pinpoint accuracy. Um, all right. Last thing before we get out of here, I mean, I'm sure we'll touch on multiple things within this topic, Joe Douglas, we talked about the coach. We've talked about the players, we've talked about the quarterback, Joe Douglas. Do you think he's on the hot seat uh, this off season? Do you think this is a make or break off season for him in the sense that if the jets put out another five win season they didn't even hit five wins but they win five games or less next season do you think there's a chance he fired that, that is a really interesting question i think the window opens this year but it's very small i think they have to be extremely disappointing but i do think there is a possibility again if if, if they're really bad like if they have another season with this like this kind of season in terms of the overall production you know four and thirteen 28th in scoring, 32nd in scoring defense type of year, then I think it's going to be on the table because at that point, because we're sitting here right now and, you know, most, this is a unique situation. Most GMs don't get to win six games in their first two years and go forward with the, with the mentality of, okay, we're early in the process. We're progressing. Things are good. He deserves uh, to keep going because Joe Douglas, absolutely. I think, you know, even objectively, not just, from you know a fan perspective i think does deserve that because he inherited an awful roster just look at the 2019 team most of those starters are either not in the league or they're backups or they're bad starters almost every single one of them so he inherited a terrible team thanks to years of bad drafting so it is warranted that he had these tough first two seasons and you know it's acceptable it's not ideal but it's it is what it is and I think it's okay for him to continue to get a chance, but you know, this isn't, this is a league where teams can turn around pretty quickly. I think taking anything more than three years for your rebuild to at least get to being a around 500 team and wild card contention is, uh, is, is too long. So uh, I think if they don't show significant progress this year, it, it might be on the table. But with that being said, I think if they're a seven, eight win team, Zach Wilson, gets a lot better and they are a clearly better team that seems like they're right on the doorstep i think he'll be back so i don't think there's a playoff mandate or winning record mandate or anything like that um and i again i think even if they're like a seven eight win team but they're clearly better he'll come back but i do think if you know they're very bad then you have to you have to think about it what do you think how what do you think the bar is for him to maintain his job I mean, it's going to be the draft class. It's like, are the rookies performing? I think that's what it's really going to come down to. I think it is going to take a lot for them to prime away. I think if they have another kind of underwhelming, 
if they get to five or six wins, I think if they're four or less, there's a real chance he might be gone. I, I personally, and it, it, again, it depends on the draft class because there's a lot of different four win seasons. If if they win four games because Zach Wilson gets injured um, and the and the quarterback play is just awful, but the rookies shine, then he's not going to get fired. But if you know, right. it, it's hard to justify another four win season for him, um, especially since he'll have had three off seasons of, of molding the roster. I think likely. If he gets fired, I don't think it's next year. I think I think you're going to see him take a jump because I think you're going to see him be a lot more aggressive. I think you're going to see him be aggressive in free agency. And obviously, the, they basically have two drafts, um, given they have two first and two seconds uh, in this in this year. And and I think this is the last time for him. And we were kind of talking about this, but this is the last. Hopefully, actually, I'll say this for for Joe Douglas. This is likely the last time he'll have a premium asset like this for a long time hopefully, because the Jets have two top 10 picks. So whether they trade down next, unless they trade down and pick up a first next year, or they suck again and they're picking nine or 10 and he hangs on, he probably won't have another opportunity like this to really improve the football team. And I think the thing that I really like about Joe Douglas is first of all, I believe in his vision and he has one, he has a plan and his plan is really intertwined with the coaching staff. They're on the same page. And that sounds simple. And that sounds like every single team should have that. But the Jets for the last 10 years have not had that. They have not had a defined plan. And the coaching staff and head coach and general manager weren't on the same page. You'd end up, you know, drafting guys who just didn't fit the scheme. Like I think of, and I don't know the background of how he became the pick, but think of a guy like Darren Lee when the Jets drafted him. Not a 3-4 inside linebacker for Todd Bowles' defense. And I'm sure he maybe he signed off on it or whatever, but that's just a a, a blatant not following a process or a plan. I mean, that's just, okay, you like this guy and you're taking him, find a role for him, but he's not a three, four inside linebacker. And he wasn't very good to begin with, but as a four, three wheel linebacker, that's his fit in the NFL and the jets right now. I don't think you're going to see that as much. They're drafting to fit a scheme. They have a clear vision of, Hey, we want to build the trenches, which is admirable. A lot of teams say that, but how many teams act on it? I think the jets really are. I think this is Joe Douglas last premium picks possibly. And I think he's really going to put a stamp on the type of team that he wants to have. I've gone back and forth on this. I've said, you know, maybe take Kyle Hamilton, maybe trade down, whatever. I think they look to trade down. Some people are going to cringe at this. I, I do think offensive line is really in play at four. I think you could really look at an Evan Neal or an Eka McWanu. Um, and part of the reason is, is not because they can be tackles because we just talked about George Fan and Mackay Becton, but the positional versatility they bring you because you could put, let's just use Evan Neal, for example, Evan Neal's played guard and he's played right tackle. And he's played left tackle. So you can, year one, if you like both Fan and Becton, you can put Becton at left tackle, Neal at right guard and Fant at, at right tackle. You can move Becton over to right tackle. And then you got Evan Neal next to Mackay Becton <laughs> on your offensive line. I think he really... I think he's fine having three premium assets on that offensive line. And he had a really interesting quote on his press conference yesterday where he said, um, you know, he's talking about the offensive line and obviously he said, you know, Robert and I both believe in building through the trenches, but he, he said, we made a lot of strides when referring to the offensive line, but to get to where we want to go to, we have to be the best. So that means while the Jets offensive line, if they bring back McGovern and LDT and Becton comes back, that's probably what you know maybe 15th ranked offensive line solid offensive line you got holes elsewhere I don't think that's good enough for Joe Douglas Joe Douglas wants to have the best offensive line in all football and when you look at best player available need and the type of of positions they want to invest in value it's the offensive line so I think offensive line and f4 makes a lot of sense we got very sidetracked here but um just a that was just a quick not so quick sidebar um, I think offensive lineman is definitely in play and, and, but circling back to what I was saying, I like that they have a plan. They have a vision. They, and I think this is a real opportunity to put their mark on the type of team they want to be. They, they have a true identity. If they go in and they take an Evan Neal at four and you know, Salah wants to build up the defensive line. So just for example, let's say they take Evan Neal at four and George collapses at 10. If he, if he falls that far, two picks in the trenches, I think you really make a statement on the type of team that the New York Jets are, because this is a team that just hasn't had an identity since Rex Ryan and the ground and pound days. So uh, I would not hate that uh, at all. Um, when you look at the, the biggest needs, you made a, like a tweet where you had uh, absolute necessary needs, uh, some, whatever, I forget the exact phrasing of it. What do they need to do? We talk about making this a playoff team, Joe Douglas being in the hot, hot seat what is what type of off season does joe douglas need to have what type of positions does he need to address um to make this into a a 
playoff team next year. Yeah, it's really tough. And and like I said at the beginning of this podcast, it's one of the harder off seasons to project because it doesn't feel like there are a specific couple needs. Like we got to support the quarterback. We got to get a pass rusher to run this defense, things like that. They can address so many positions. So I guess the most general way to put it is that they got, I guess there are two things. I said I would say number one is supplement the quarterback, which is until your quarterback, you know, you're young, QB figures that out you got to continue getting him as much help as possible and I think the Jets have a lot more talent around Wilson going into year two than they did with Darnold but at the same time they're still not completely there so it's still a priority Um, number two is just flat out get difference makers on defense um, because they don't have a ton right now and you know you have CJ Mosley Quinn Williams and Franklin Myers can be that Um, Bryce Hall can be that and is a good starter, but um, they really need guys who are game changers because this is a defense defensive scheme that more than most needs that talent to shine. It's kind of designed to maximize talent and get the most out of it. That's what we saw in San Francisco in 2019. Um, Once they really beefed up that pass rush and put together D Ford, Nick Boza, Eric Armstead, DeForest Buckner, that's when everything started clicking. Um, because it allows those guys to just go to work and pin their ears back and rush. And when you have great rushers, the results are fantastic. But when you have Tim Ward and Shaq Lawson and all these guys, it, the results aren't going to be pretty. So it, it is obviously injuries part of that, losing Carl Lawson. But um, that's going to be big. Can they get difference-making players? And then behind that, the, you know, the trade-off of running that kind of scheme is that there's more ground for everyone else to cover. And the Jets also – in terms of coverage this year they did play a decent amount of, of man coverage like you mentioned tony odin what he brought over to san francisco he's a you know secondary coach i think cornerbacks and defensive backs coach there now um and they did run a pretty decent amount of man coverage this year they were 13th in terms of how often their corners ran man coverage in the league so um the guys behind the the pass rush have a lot more responsibilities the linebackers have to cover more ground these corners have to play uh, a good mix of different responsibilities. It's not cookie cutter, one type of, you know, just zone coverage or anything. So everyone's got a lot of responsibility in this defense to win their battles, whether it's in coverage as pass rushers. But if those guys are talented, like we saw in San Francisco, it can lead to really great results because it puts them in position to just win with their talent and not have to do as much thinking and executing blitzes um, and, you know, running complex different coverages like, you know, the Jets' previous defenses might have asked them to. So it's very talent-based, and that's what we've seen with the scheme over the years. In Seattle, San Francisco, even Jacksonville, when teams have had the talent, they've been awesome. When they haven't, they've really struggled. Um, Obviously, that goes for any team, but it's very specific in this scheme, which is talent-emphasizing. So um, difference makers at any position on defense. Keep beefing up that D-line if you want to, even on the interior um but specifically on the edge um and then whether behind that whatever you can get whether it's a big time linebacker playmaking free safety or strong state box safety um if it's a ball hawking corner or a guy who just is a you know shut down type of guy even without the interceptions whatever you can get uh, they need big time playmakers on defense so i guess i said two simple answers and i went into that but supporting the quarterback and difference makers on defense. Yeah, I think that's that's incredibly smart. I think one of the things, and this kind of goes back to what I was just saying about the potential that they'll take an offensive lineman at four. One of the things I noticed last year uh, when we looked at him, because we can see some trends now that Joe Douglas has had two off seasons in charge. So I think it can lead us to some clues of what he he might do this year. Um, One of them is well one of them is you know in free agents when you look at the type of free agents that he's targeted and he hasn't had great success there so i wonder if you'll see a change in strategy but he seems to have taken a few guys based off projection i mean i think of of draw davis i think of george fant fant worked out davis not so much of you know high athletic profiles maybe haven't lived up to expectations seemingly good scheme fits seeing if we can unlock them so like you know when i look at free agents it's like do they take a shot in a guy like David Njoku fits that profile pretty much exactly young, highly athletic, underwhelmed a little bit, but maybe, and obviously he's more of a pass catching tight end, but his blocking's gotten better, but maybe in this scheme, uh, 
if they find a role for him, maybe they can unlock him. So I think that's something to keep an eye out when you look at free agents. He's he's gonna they're gonna take a few dart throws like that. I really do think they should. Um, it, I think Marcus Williams is gonna shake free. He's the number one free agent for me, just in terms of I think he's gonna hit the board. I think he's gonna become available. I don't think he's gonna be crazy expensive. He fits a need. Safety is a huge need. Fits the scheme. So that's a guy. Home run. Dalton Schultz is another guy that I think. I mean, they definitely need to address tight end. Preferably, you do it in free agency and then you go in the draft. Schultz has been playing so well and has put up so much so much production over the last few weeks that even though the Cowboys extended Blake Jarwin, I feel like they may try to re-sign Dalton Schultz. And if if not, I think Schultz is going to get a big contract. So this Jets should certainly be, certainly be players there. Um, if he chooses to re-sign or doesn't want to go to New York, whatever it is, it's still a great tight end class. So I mentioned to Joku, there's still Hayden Hurst, there's CJ Uzama. I mean, there's a ton of great tight ends in free agency. So it's like, like you said, I think you got to support the quarterback, go get a tight end, go get difference makers on defense. Um, Another thing is in the draft, what I kind of noticed as well is, it, and we, we get in the habit of doing this, and I'm going to try my best not to do this 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 spring. And it's going to lead to some people criticizing, I guess, you know, mock drafts or whatever. But every year we look at the mock draft, like, and you, you I love your term, you call it a grocery list, where it's, you know, we're trying to fill needs. Joe Douglas doesn't do that. And I think one of the things that you could take away is he looked at last year, and I think receiver is a good example of this. First of all, they're just taking the best players on their board, the guys that they love at positions they want to invest in. But he specifically last year, it seems like instead of trying to fill every hole and make, you know, a bad position into an okay position, he he really focused on making solid positions into good positions or good positions into great positions. That's why I think O-line is certainly in play at four. That's why I think the D-line or edge is certainly in play. Um, I think he's going to try to you know, you talk about protecting the quarterback, get difference makers. I think he's going to try to have the Jets uh, enforce their identity, make the trenches great. They're good right now, make them even better. And I think that is um, going to be something that you're going to see this offseason, that they're really going to full on invest there. I know some people think, all right, well, defensive line, you get Carl Lawson back and offensive line, you get Makai Becton back. So they're going to improve. They're going to get better. But I think Joe Douglas wants to have the best uh, in the trenches. There is a lot to talk about um, all offseason, Michael. I mean, we didn't do a mock draft today. Um, we're going to have one soon. We're going to get in depth on the free agents. We're going to do some film reviews on Zach Wilson or maybe guys like Quinnen or other, you know, other players, and that'll be more on the YouTube. Um, we have some interviews. I mean, this is, as I said, this is the time the podcast thrives the most. I feel like that was a good briefing on the year, maybe a quick little primer towards the end, um, but I guess the message is like, yeah, this is it. This is the off season to really turn it around. It's, it is, maybe it's not necessarily make or break for Joe Douglas. Some would argue it is, but it's certainly make or break to whether or not the jets um, are going to take that leap. Cause they certainly can take that. Uh, the Bengals took such a leap this past year. So it's maybe unfair to compare them to them, but they can take a Bengals like leap. They can go from four wins to the playoffs if they play their cards. Right. I mean, they have so many assets available that it's not out of the, the realm of possibility. Um, but at the very least, they just they have to stick the landing on this offseason. Um, you can follow us at TYJ Pod on Twitter. You can follow Michael at Michael underscore Nania, myself at Ben W. Blessington. Go to JetsXFactor.com for the best place to go for Jets content. Michael, last thoughts? Uh, I, I like what you just said about in terms of the draft, not you know pinpointing positions and checking out boxes and stuff like that because – I, the shopping list is really the best way to look at it because sometimes you go to the store and you have your list of everything you want to get and you might already have plenty of boxes of cheerios at home but if they're 50 percent off you got to buy some more anyway just stock <laughs> up on cheerios you know you, you, exactly. we got two great offensive tackles so you know if you can get one that you think is worthy of getting at the fourth pick that um you're surprised to be there go ahead and, and get them you know so i think <laughs> We're we're gonna do some mock drafts out of defensive tackles this year. We're gonna we're gonna double dip on some safeties. We're gonna okay, pick right, some yeah, offensive tackles in the first round. We're gonna oh, get god. wild. Oh god. <laughs> well, the offensive t- it's it's as soon as you know- mention defensive tackles, someone closes out your mock draft and doesn't look at the rest of it. <laughs> I, hey, if they don't address it in free agency, I would not be incredibly surprised that they use. I would hope they wouldn't use one of the top four picks, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the third round they took a defensive tackle. Um, the only reason I think Neil and Ekwanu uh, make a lot of sense is because they have that guard versatility because, and I like a guy like Kenyon green, or even you throw a lender bomb in there. If it's like, okay, if you think your tackles are good and you think you want to, the last places that you can really take a jump are at, at center and right guard, 
Um, why don't you just take a, an interior offensive lineman? Granted, Green has played some tackle. But I think I, the thing you really like is, one, those two guys are arguably best players in the, the class. But, two, it gives you the, the tackle flexibility and the insurance of, oh, what is if – if Becton can't stay healthy or he doesn't live up to expectations or what if Fant regressed, it's like, Oh, you take this guy, you can plug him in right now and you can play all five of them. So you're, you're getting a guy who can play immediately, but also there is that long-term vision of like, Hey, it gives us some insurance here. Um, and I think I, I really do believe that it, Joe Douglas, when he looks back at his career, he, he doesn't want to look back and think that he half-assed the offensive line. I really don't think he does. I think he's a guy who wants to, to look back at his career and say, I had the best damn offensive line in football. So investing three premium picks in offensive line, some teams wouldn't do it. But here's my my one question to you, Michael. Name one bad team with an amazing offensive line. You can't find them. Washington right. football this year is the only team that I can think of that had a good offensive line that may be underperformed. But then you look at everything else they had going on around them. You know, if you have any semblance of quarterback play, you're going to be good. But if you build an amazing offensive line, especially, look, you got a running back in Michael Carter there who is going to maximize every time he gets the ball. And you got a quarterback in Zach Wilson you believe in. I mean, you have a real opportunity. It's like, oh, if you give Zach an amazing offensive line, look at what he had at BYU. I mean, that was a big criticism was he had like five second pockets, but it gave him time to make those reads. It gave him times to create. So it helps your young quarterback. He's not going to be put in the position that he's been put in the last the last game of the season or even the, the fourth quarter against Tampa Bay. And it gives you an identity. It allows you to run the football, which if you want to win a Super Bowl, you have to be able to run the football in January and December. I'm sorry. You have to be able to run the football and stop the run. And so, yeah, I, I, I really do. The last few days, I've kind of changed my tune a little bit. I'm like, you know, ideally, maybe you'd spread the assets around a little better. But when I think about what I think Joe Douglas wants to do and what is honestly the smart move for the Jets, maybe it is to take an alignment at four. But we have months to discuss this. This is always my favorite time to waffle because I, I've come out with maybe three different differing opinions the last three episodes and the, the opinions don't in my mind for draft don't get locked in until about march we have to see what they do in free agency because look they could go sign a guy like brandon scherf and then is it the smartest thing to draft an offensive lineman at four maybe not so this is the best time you just spitball some ideas you finalize them by march and then you roll um how, how you- much do you think nfl teams mirror this like kind of match the same mentality of waffling do you think they're more i mean i'm sure they are more rigid and just kind of define that we are but how much deliberation do you think they have i think there's a lot of deliberation in this time because it, not necessarily right now but more times you get to february and the senior bowl and scouting combine because i think that's when the coaching staff really gets involved because up until this point i don't really think I mean, i'm sure sala or lafleur i'm sure they've seen some prospects or maybe they've watched some just bombs productions highlights <laughs> but i don't think they've really <laughs> dove into the draft yet and i think once your coaches get involved your coaches are going to find some guys they love um, and your coaches are going to give, you know, some help to the scouts and the types of players they're looking for, you know, it, it adjusts the process. And then that's how you get the fun. So I think, you know, when you're in March, I think you are having a lot of active discussions because not everybody's going to agree. You know, if you and I were in a, a war room, I think, you know, we agree on a lot of things, but in draft stuff, sometimes we go back and forth and it's the same process with, yeah. with any well-run organization. You can't have that group think. Um well, we'll have a lot of episodes coming out this, this these next few months. Looking forward to it. Thank you to everybody listening. Thank you for another season. Michael, I think we we haven't seen too many wins in the history of this podcast. We started right before the 2019 no. season. <laughs> so we've, we've had a rough stretch here. But the, the off season is our time. And I think, uh, I think we're going to have a good one. So really looking forward to the next few months with you. Thank you to everybody listening. Go Jets. No more time. No more Sundays to let the Jets ruin your life for the next few weeks. So just enjoy the playoffs. Pick another team. Uh, The Jets are coaching the Senior Bowl in a few weeks, so that's somewhat exciting. You get to see them, I guess, coach another game. So lots to look forward to. Thank you for listening. Go Jets.